Hi, uh, I am Kara. I'm going to be talking about feelings and video games. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit about mental illness and trauma, um, mostly about feelings in a more abstract way, but if it's ever too much or ever not what you want right now, um, no worries at all. It's OK to leave. Um, oh, yeah, you're welcome to tweet at me. Um, it's Kara A. Stone. I retweet like every mention of myself, so just like know that. <laughs> Um, I'm an artist. I work in different media, a lot of interactive art, um, gamey stuff recently in the past two years. I did my master's degree here in Toronto focusing on gender and mental illness and video games, so feelings are kind of my thing. Um, uh, the first game I made is specifically about mental health and mental illness. Uh, it's called Medication Meditation and it's about a video game about my lifestyle of living with mental health issues. Um, many of the levels are taken from exercises uh, that doctors and therapists have given me or mental health workbooks that I've worked my way through. Um, and so the game was a lot about exploring the amount of effort that goes into the work of living with mental illness, uh, things that are overlooked in our common narratives. Um, another game that I made about feelings, but in a different way, is called Sex Adventure. And it's a choose your own adventure, and you're sexting with a robot. Um, <laughs> and it's a lot about, it's very funny. I mean, it's, I, it's funny. Um, <laughs> it's about intimacy and technology and the way that um, our relationships with each other are translated and affected by the technology that we use. Um, made cyclothymia recently. Uh, it's about astrology and mental health, literally cyclothymia. It's a mental disorder similar to bipolar disorder, um, categorized by cycles of highs and lows. And this game for me was an exploration of alternative and non-medicalized ways of understanding feelings and um, mental health. And I made Fairweather for Fortunes with Beth Marr, and it's nostalgia, looking back at childhood, um, playing childhood games like MASH, and this is a cootie catcher, um, thinking about things that have never come to fruition and desires that have, haven't been fulfilled. And I'm now making a game called Ritual of the Moon, which is about loneliness and betrayal and how to heal or how to destroy the whole world. So uh, obviously I'm really into making things about feelings and it's been a really big part of um, my art creation and, and learning to think about things. But I came to it from thinking about video games and mental illness and the different ways they're represented in conjunction with each other. So in the media, when there's video games and there's mental health, both together, often it's portrayed as addiction, uh, shootings, social anxiety and mood disorders. In games, the representation of those with mental health issues are people to shoot and kill or disorienting storylines, um, big part of horror because apparently it's very scary, um, and the generalized insane rather than any specific feelings. Um, I'm not going to be talking about the criticism of the media or criticism of representation in games, but we definitely should consider them all the time um, throughout this presentation. But I'm going to be focusing on design and making games and uh, interacting, how mental health interacts with feminism and anti-oppression and game design. Um, so so-called emotional factors have been examined when determining the drive to play video games. Um, the video game industry employs capitalist utilization of emotions in order to design, sell, market, and gather interest in um, playing and purchasing video games. Distraction, loneliness, pleasure, um, they're mostly the sites of motivation to play. Fear, excitement, anger are common um, emotions that are positioned in the content. It's assumed that these emotional factors are fulfilled through video games uh, due to the incredible profit that is made. Um, specifically, it's assumed that young, white, heteronormative men's desires are fulfilled uh, with the people often say, well, if they didn't want these sexist video games, they wouldn't buy them. Um, but within capitalism, pleasure, desire, and emotional fulfillment are measured only through the amount of money made. Like, there's no other way of measuring these feelings. Um, so I want to explore through design and through our creation, um, what are other ways that we can think about it? Uh, yeah, so affect. Um, I'm really into feelings, emotion, affect. 
Um, affect is like this super esoteric thing called affect theory in academia, if you've heard of it. It's really cool, I love it. Um, but I'll just give a quick overview of what I mean when I say affect. Um, it's very, it, it's like somatic and precognitive. Um, it's a recognition of feelings as a force or an intensity um, and the capacity to move and be moved. Um, affect theory has made affect, emotion, and feelings into a subjective study. Um, so it's not only the thing that is being studied, but ways of studying. And it's thinking about feelings as really connected to the body. So um, emotions aren't things that are just existing in your mind or in your brain, um, but they're located and activated and felt throughout the whole body. Hence my like for the word feelings, because it's both emotional um, or psychic and physical. Um, let me look. All right. Feelings have always been connected strongly to feminism and anti-racism and, of course, mental health advocacy. Um, discussion and interrogation of feelings has long been a part of feminist theory. Uh, you've probably heard the long-standing mantra, the personal is political. Um, meaning that theoretical practice is not separate from everyday life, and public and private are super, super intertwined. Uh, emotions are really, really gendered. Uh, excessive emotions or paying attention to emotions, intuitions are gendered as feminine. Um, emotions and the body have long been discounted uh, from sites of information and knowledge. Uh, the separation of rational and th uh, yeah, the separation of rational thought and emotion as like two separate things um, is often used to create a distinction between the animal and human. And that often is to reinforce sexist and racist discourses construction, um, constructing women and racialized groups as closer to nature or more animal-esque. Um, language is extremely important to defining communication. Uh, Jasper Puar, who is a disability scholar, states that the inability to communicate functions as the single determinant of mental and cognitive impairment, thus destabilizing the centrality of the human capacity for thought and cognition. So what is counted as communication is determined by the non-debilitated. There are many modes of communication, yet only a few are recognized and desired by dominant powers. Uh, emotions are a mode of communication. Uh, you can walk into the room and you, people often say they can feel the room or sense um, a feeling in the room. And this means that emotions can be communicated without being transcribed or, uh, or transcribed into verbal-based language in order for information transference. Uh, there is an effective sphere in which feelings are activated in the body. Um, Puar theorizes that effective transference is done through an array of diverse switch points located in the body. From this view, uh, the interactivity of video games becomes super important for understanding the connection between affect and gaming. In video games, emotional responses in gameplay are not solely a response to the content of the game, but to the physical activity and the mechanics of the interaction. So emotion is not only experienced by the player as a consequence of events in the game world, but actively expressed by them in the form of facial and vocal cues, of physiological changes, and physical and gestural interaction, um, connecting to the interface of the game. But standard controllers offer limited opportunity for expressing or mobilizing the corporeal dimensions of emotion in a useful way. Standard video game interfaces um, normalize and limit uh, effective responses. So, for example, when a video game is trying to make you really anxious, like that's the content, that's the setting you're supposed to be worried that you're gonna get shot or something, um, it tries to make you so nervous and yet if you act on those things, if your hands are fidgety or if you're shaking, um, that's detrimental, you're punished in the game world. It's not really exploring those things. You're supposed to get rid of your feedback. Um, that is the popular way, of course, there are really awesome games that work with that. Oh. Well, that says video games are sensuous. 
Um, so yes, video games operate on interactivity. We all know this, we hear this all the time. Um, but through that, they operate through sensu uh, se the senses, so vision and sound, um, but most integrally touch and body movement. Uh, you control almost all games by touch in the movement of your own physical body. Uh, many, many indie games have sensed this interaction, um, body to screen or body to game, and foregone traditional controllers for sensual fabric, uh, heartbeat monitors, or other people's bodies. Um, so you can see MOOF at um, the left and heartbeat amplifier. Um, they're both cool. To take it to the extreme, uh, this is a game called Death With 3000, and it uses smelling as an integral mechanic to the gameplay. It's a zombie game, and the players have to determine if a smell is a diseased human or a non-infected human. Um, the smells were actually uh, essential oils, but... Um, and then the smell makes the players have a decision on how to proceed. Uh, something that comes up a lot in games, especially talking about mental health, is this dichotomy between good and bad feelings. Good and bad in itself like runs really deep. Um, when games handle mental illness, that puts forth a dichotomy even more. In mainstream and pop psychology, health and disability are constructed as good or bad, positive or negative, body or mind. Um, and we should aim to break down this dualistic thinking through moving towards what queer theorist Eve Sedgwick coins as reparative readings, which is a less suspicious style of critique seeking to repair and heal wounds rather than simply pointing out new, more insidious forms of oppression. Um, affect theorists try to break down the definitive border or the dichotomous borders um, between things like good and bad, healthy and ill, uh, Anne Spekovich, a queer debility scholar, writes that the goal of her own work is to depathologize negative affects so they're not medicalized to the extent of their dismissal as a resource for political action. She is careful not to suggest that mental illness is bad um, and the feelings associated with them are bad um, and that bad affects should be transformed into positivity. Um, and in fact, depression, which is what she talks about specifically, uh, retains its associations with inertia and despair, if not apathy and indifference. But these affects become sites of publicity and community formation. So bad experiences and so-called negative feelings are not forced to transform into a positive or a celebration or looking on the bright side, um, but instead are framed to be considered as political statements. Um, so it's never to find the good in mental illness. Um, instead, to explore those feelings we feel are wrong or told are bad and use them to build communities and start social change. I think a way of thinking about this comes from reparative art taken from Sedgwick's reparative reading. Um, so I think that it's a way that could be not only to criticize games for certain shitty aspects, um, but also to heal and offer new options. So when making the games I've made, I've never thought much about the pitfalls or the wounds of video games and how I would work to heal them. Uh, I don't come in being like, I'm gonna make a game that you can't win. Um, it just happens like that because it best expresses the ideas and the uh, things that I want to explore. I don't want to offer criticism of dominant narratives of mental health and of standard video games, but add something that expressed not only the downfalls, but the, um, the possibilities of effective games. There's a long history of people using and creating art to help work through things. Um, we don't have to think of it as an expression or a demonstration of a fully worked out an idea, um, but an exploration of a feeling of something mysterious, of something that we can't really put our finger on. Um, framing it as an exploration, we learn to witness ourselves, the way we feel, the way we process, and how we come to our thinking. Um, creating art, and of course video games in this, can be a powerful method of learning, uh, not just demonstrating. So how can we do this in more practical ways um, in thinking about design? Thinking about feelings in the body, um, feelings you want the player to have, Sometimes we get really focused on the mechanic, or even we get really focused on the story, that we forget sometimes about feelings, both physical and mental. 
beyond the mood and the color palette and the, that the music gives. Um, not to say that that isn't important, but it can come, feelings can come from all of the ways of the interaction or all of the ways of the art piece. For example, the game that I said that I was working on, Ritual of the Moon, I wanted to explore feelings of loneliness and anger and betrayal. So when I'm thinking about um, an interaction that the player does, I'm thinking about how it feels in someone's body. Should they tap really fast uh, in an angry sense, or they, do I want them to feel really anxiety uh, or full of anxiety? Um, should they really lightly like drag their fingers across the screen as if they're you know, a ghost who's not really there? For cyclothymia, I thought about meditation or rather um, contemplation rather than analyzing. So there are no instructions, but there's also nothing rushing the player. Uh, the mechanics are really, really simple, um, just like clicking and dragging things around. But there's something to figure out, and it's not fully understandable, um, just like trying to figure out cycles of mania and depression and astrology. Uh, so in sum, uh, feelings are important information. <laughs> Let's consider them when we're designing games. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? Uh, the question was, what are some good examples? Um, there are lots, and um, some that I think of and I think about a lot are uh, Ariel Grimes. She's based out of here in Toronto. Um, she has a game called What Now? And it is a game about anxiety and panic. It's really awesome. Um, she has a lot of games, so I highly recommend hers. Um, I think Actual Sunlight, by Will O'Neill is really good as well. Um, I think it places players in an understandable um, yet evocative sense of depression. Um, what else do I really like? I'll think of more as we go. Those are the, well, Ariel has tons. Um, the question is how to get more of the community involved in making games and participating in, in gameplay. That's a great question, and that's something that's really important to me. Um, one big thing is to have incubators and have workshops about mental health and video games, and that can be in a lot of different ways. That can be about um, playing games together as a soothing way. It can be teaching people how to make games as a form of self-expression close to art therapy. For example, I did some work with um, TIFF Real Comfort where we went into um, hospitals in Toronto and to their psychiatric wards and we made twine games. Um, but it wasn't as a way to like uh, flush out as a therapy. It was a fun distraction tool because sometimes when you're in psychiatry units, um, there is no outside world. So um, that's one way. Um, another way is those community groups um, to have more knowledge about different types of mental illness and different feelings. And so um, being really open if people can't come into work or don't feel like they can come in, um, of spaces being too loud. Um, you know, AlterConf is a really great example of different rules um, that can be in, put in place to have the community be more open. Any more questions? All right, thank you.